Hi, and welcome to the show. Rate and review the show at kevinmd.com slash rate. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash podcast. Today in the show, we have Beth Boynton. She's a nurse and a consultant. We're going to talk about her Kevin MD article, Leading an Organizational Culture Change. Consider an apology first. Beth, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kevin. I'm happy to be here. I just found out that you were also in New Hampshire on the seacoast, so we're practically neighbors. We are. We're just about an hour away. So we're going to talk about your article in a little bit, but first off, briefly share your story and journey to where you are today. Okay, thank you. So I had a degree in biochemistry before I went to nursing school. I went to nursing school in my late 20s, discovered, wow, this is really a rigorous program of study. Got out of nursing school, started working in the typical hospital settings, got into occupational health and home health, where I really enjoyed those places. Cause I think because I had a little more autonomy, got in a serious relationship, bought a house, got a dog, had a kid in that relationship for about 10 years. And then my partner left me. And so that was like a difficult, painful point in my life and career. It got me into counseling where I started to realize that I gave up my voice in relationship. And I was like, as a nurse, I was a really good advocate for other people, but I wasn't very good at advocating for myself. So I started going down this path of learning to identify my own needs and desires and how to express them respectfully. Also, I was taking improv classes as kind of a hobby, and I discovered there that some of the things I was practicing, like self-expression and confidence, I was learning about them in therapy, but I could actually practice them in improv. And it was more fun <laughs> than some of the personal work. So, and then in my career, as I started to become more assertive for myself, I discovered that I couldn't, I, it was really hard to be assertive in an environment that I was working. And a quick example, I would s be asked to work overtime. I say, I can't, my son's with me. My boss would say, there's the door. My peers would say, well, I had to do it. Or can't you just, can't you do just one weekend and that kind of stuff. So there was a point around the turn of the century where I was like fed up. I felt like I couldn't mm -hmm. be healthy as a nurse. So I'm going to go to graduate school. I'm going to study something, organization and management. I used improv. I developed a model to teach emotional intelligence to kids and communication to kids. Got out of graduate school, started building a business that way. And then I was asked to teach a course to graduate students in healthcare, contemporary issues. And that's when the Institute of Medicine was publishing to air as human and mm -hmm. crossing the quality chasm. We were discovering, oh, we're making a lot of mistakes. And some of the, a lot of those mistakes have a basis in communication. So I realized the stuff I was teaching using theater games with kids, I could use with adults. I started developing a consulting business, teaching communication, writing communication. And I started to use little experiential activities from improv in my workshops. And I was like, oh, that's what works. I can talk about listening till the cows come home. But if I can give somebody an experience where they get to practice listening with their peers and then debrief it with their peers. That's when the light bulbs go off. So more and more, I've been integrating improv and focusing on improv as an experiential teaching modality. And I've also been honored to write a couple of, I've written a textbook called Successful Nurse Communication, which the revision is coming out by F.A. Davis on, in this December. Complexity Leadership, I was asked to co-author a third edition of that book. And so I have like this ac very academic part of my mm. career and then this other part that's a little bit more informal in terms of how I approach education. So that's now, kind of the story. Now, this isn't the first time where I've heard about that in, that intersection between improv, improvisation, and healthcare. Go a little bit more detail. Give us a story or an example about how improv skills can help us with communication skills in the healthcare setting. 
Sure, could give you a couple examples. One is an activity called same time story. And that's where one person is telling a story and another person is supposed to try to tell it at the same time, which sounds like it's impossible, it's story mirror. But what happens is this person has to slow down and this person has to really pay attention and they can't actually be thinking of 20 other things, which we tend to do, which interferes with our listening. And so that's like a fun activity. People are a little silly with it, but then we debrief and how was that activity for you? And I, in fact, I had one nurse tell me once that was the first time she ever felt heard. Mm. And so when I hear that, I think, oh my gosh, how are we ever going to expect her to be a good listener if she doesn't know what it feels like to be heard? So that's like one example. So let's talk about your Kevin MD article titled Leading an Organizational Culture Change. Consider mm -hmm. an Apology First. Now, for those of you who get a chance to read your article, just walk my audience through it and share the story why you decided to write it. Yeah, we know that we need to create cultures of safety, and we've known that for a long time. And I think one of the things that gets lost is that we don't realize that trust, broken trust is at the bottom of many of these talk bullying or blaming cultures. And that if we're really going to change them, we have to get, we have to rebuild trust. And so in the article, I talk a little bit about how mistrust is, becomes ingrained in our relationships. It's like, I don't trust you. You don't trust me. We form alignments that we form relationships that are based on mistrust rather than on trust. Instead of learning from each other, we might blame each other for an issue or we might withhold information. So we don't have trust. We have all the gossiping and blaming, bullying, both withholding things that we hear about all the time, but don't necessarily change. So I talk a little bit about that. And then I talk about why, if we really want to change them, one of the important things to start with is to acknowledge that inappropriate behavior is not okay. It never was, and it isn't going to be that way from now on, but to make having an apology part of that message so that we, you can, it's almost like modeling ownership of mm. the problem. And so I have in the article, I write a simple letter, dear staff, I'm writing as a CEO, and this is, this is what the new expectation is. And I want you to know that it wasn't okay and it won't be okay. And th these are some steps that we're taking. So, and that, that is not going to be changing the whole culture right there, but it's a place to start building trust. Now, when you said that a lot of relationships in the hospital healthcare setting is sometimes based on mistrust, where are those divisions? Are we talking about nurses and clinicians? Are we talking about administrators and healthcare staff? So tell us about some of the divisions that you see in the healthcare setting. Kevin, I think they're, they're throughout, uh, they can be, I mean, there are healthy organizations out there and all the power to the people that work in them. I think there are mistrust among nurses, I think between doctors and nurses, between senior leaders and managers, between managers and staff, between nurses and nurses aides. I just, I don't think we have a solid foundation of trust in many places. So when you say consider an apology first. So that speaks to a person's or an entity's humility, right? And I think that, it, I agree with you, that is one of the best ways that we can build trust. So from a clinician standpoint, if we wanted to change a culture, start with an apology first. So give us some advice in terms of how we can do that, how we can present that apology and reach out with that olive branch. Well, I think it probably starts with self-reflection and ownership, like what's my part in this issue? And so if I can take a deep breath and not be defensive and try to consider the other person's perspective, then I can get to a place of having some ownership and understanding. That's like clinician to clinician. I think as a and leader- And that's hard, right? Just oh. having that self-reflection. No, if, if we can do that in our society, it would be much less politicized and polarized, right? You it's have, very you, hard. It's you, very hard. You have that background in, you know, improvisation and things like that. So, so give us some advice. So, so you make it sound so easy. Just have the self-reflection, but at the moment, <laughs> it's actually very difficult. It's very hard. So how do you advise us to do that? And I think it's even harder in our profession because we are under this constant relentless pressure yeah. that we, and it's always high stakes. So how are we going to change? Like it's a behavior. How are we going to change behavior when we have this constant stress? And I think the place to start is to, we, I'm going to respect myself 
and I'm going to respect you. I'm going to respect the limits that I have. I'm going to respect the limits that you have. I think that's a really good place to start. And if doctors and nurses, if all of the clinicians in the world can do that, we can have a serious impact on the cultures that we work in. I mean, right now, this might sound a little flippant or something, but I think the tail is wagging the dog. And I think you had a post on LinkedIn recently about the importance of doctors' voices. And I say the same about nurses' voices. And if we can be, come from a place of respect for ourselves and each other and clearly state what we need and what we want to have in terms of a safe, respectful environment with the resources that we need, and to be able to say, no, I can't do that. I have to go home. I have my family. I have my improv class or whatever, you know, other self-care piece. That makes me think of the other point about self-care because I, and maybe that fits in with self-respect that I think that's really important for us. So give us an example where this particular technique that you mentioned, the humility leading with an apology first. Give us an example of how that moved the needle and change a culture in a case study, or give us an example. Well, I remember a time I was working as a nurse on a locked unit, on a dementia unit, and I was asked, I, I, there were two adjacent units, and a nurse's assistant came to me and said that somebody on the other unit had uh, a skin tear and that I had to take over and I was like what do you mean that's on that other unit she said well you're supervising me and I just I was like <laughs> I did not know that I was supervising you and so I was like you know and I had my hands full on my own unit went through the process did what I needed to do that night but I went home and I was like so angry and frustrated and I felt like I have to go in and talk with the scheduler I have to own you know my concern and my limitation and that took me like two days to like process to talk about being hard right so that was just so hard what was going on for me internally because I felt like was I inadequate that I couldn't just rush over and fix that problem Anyway, I went in and I talked with the scheduler and he said, well, he couldn't make any promises. And I, I was like, I took this deep breath and I said, well, I have to talk with the director then. And I went up the long staircase into the director of nurse's office. And I said, you know, I'm sorry that I can't do what you're asking me to do. If that's an expectation of me, I just can't do it. And we had a very nice conversation and she actually ended up saying, okay, we, we can revisit this in six months, which allowed for me to exhale. If, I mean, if it was me that I was inadequate and needed more training or more time than was reasonable for an art registered nurse to have, then I could be part, I could look at those areas of growth and maybe the director could look at the area that maybe we don't have enough people to do what we're asking you to do, or maybe it's an excessive workload. So, and I think that, you know, that's often part of the, when we go to try to fix staffing issues, if we don't have respectful conversations that may lead to new ideas and may lead to, well, this might not be a good job match, that had to be something that I had to at least look at that we just stay in these power struggles so that goes back to your point i think kevin about how hard self-reflection is it's scary it's emotionally risky i don't want to be inadequate we're talking to beth boynton she's a nurse and a consultant her kevin md article is titled leading an organizational culture change consider an apology first beth tell us something that you're passionate about that you're working on right now I thank you for asking. I am very passionate about how medical improv can help us in healthcare because it is a teaching modality that can be used to decrease stress, to improve communication, to help us have positive relationships with each other, and to help with emotional intelligence. So it because it can help with all those things, I and it can also be done in a fairly short amount of time. So I'm really excited about 
some collaborations I have. I work with Ellen Schnur and Jim Masir of Improv Talk, and she's a former corporate trainer, and he's a former Major League Baseball pitcher. He was born with a club foot. And so the three, and they have an improv business, and together we just did a, a workshop with Ball State University faculty and students on medical improv to help with interprofessional communication competencies. And that was very successful. And so it's like we spend a get people in the room and do these activities. And some people learn to listen, some people develop confidence, some mm -hmm. people become more trusting. So very passionate about that. I'm passionate about some train the trainer. I do these short hour long sessions that I just bit one activity at a time. So what I'm trying to do is like, if I can help other team leaders and managers know these short, simple activities and do like five minutes here, 10 minutes there, that we can start to create a rippling effect where we can all develop those hard skills and practice them with the people that we work in. So what's one improvisational technique that I can use in the exam room to help me become a better physician communicator? Well, the primary principle of yes and, if you stick with that and just note that that means that yes, you're going to validate the person first. It's really a listening skill. But so whatever somebody says to you in the exam room, if you just validate them as a separate experience, that can be extremely transformational. I like to use the example and back with people with dementia, if Mrs. Smith wants to set her hair on fire, sometimes we tend to say, well, you can't set your hair on fire. That's dangerous, blah, 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 blah. But what, but her wanting to set her hair on fire, validate it. You want to set your hair on fire? Tell me about that. You know, we get to have a different relationship and it is okay. She can want to set her hair on fire all she wants. She's just not going to be able to do it <laughs> in the nursing home. You know, so first we validate and that's what the yes is all about. And my final question, what are some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? We deserve to work in environments where we feel safe and respected and where we respect each other and where we have the resources that we need to do a good job, at least most of the time. I think that, you know, we deserve that. So that's what I'm going to say. Beth, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. And thanks again for being on the show. Thank you, Kevin.